Many of us want to grow and scale our mobile home park investment portfolio. So today I sit down with a good friend of mine who owns a sizable portfolio so that you can learn from his experiences, but most importantly, his epic mistake that so many other investors are making and even I almost made this mistake. Paul Stout with KP Asset Management is a good friend and business partner of mine. So listening to this unscripted discussion is going to give you a ton of insight on what you can do to become a successful real estate investor. Let's jump into it. So Paul, number one, thanks for doing this with me. Sure. Um, we're going to keep this episode short because we're going to go to dinner after this. But can you just briefly talk about you know, how you got into the business and even before that, what do you own right now? Like where, what's what's kind of your portfolio look like? So I uh, got into the business uh, around 2015. Um, have a construction background, worked in uh, the trades and in construction management, industrial construction, and uh, working too much. So decided to get into uh, um, mobile home parks. Uh, basically, uh, First purchase was back in 2016 in Springfield, Illinois, uh, property, mobile home park, and a uh, storage facility. Uh, and from that point uh, today, we uh, own and operate uh, roughly uh, 12 parks, uh, somewhere around 600 units, um, and mostly in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. That's awesome. So yeah, definitely regionally based in that Midwest area. He's got a good size portfolio, ton of experience. He knows a ton about plumbing and pipe fitting. Pipe fitting is the right word for that, right? He knows all kinds of stuff about plumbing. So if you ever need to know anything about sewer systems or you know water systems or plumbing, anything like that, this guy knows way too much about it. So we're not gonna talk about that today because that'll eat up the whole episode. But um, so let's talk, Pablo, a little bit about Maybe what is what is what got you excited about getting into mobile home parks? Well, it was basically uh, when I was working at job sites. Uh, it was very long hours. We did industrial construction. Most of the work we did was uh, based on EPA uh, mandates, and you know we had deadlines and and things always went slow. So we were working you know five, six, seven days a week, uh, ten to twelve, maybe fourteen hours a day, and even more at some time at times. So I wasn't really getting to see the family much, so I decided I needed to do something a little bit different, something that uh, we could replace my W-2 income and be able to spend more time with the family. And so I decided that real estate was really about the only thing that seemed to interest me. And in looking at uh, building up the portfolio while working 70, 80 hours a week, uh, single family didn't really do it for me. Uh, seemed a little bit too slow. Seemed like the management was a little too, uh, you know, involved. Uh, then multifamily again didn't really excite me that much. Came across mobile home parks, and it seemed like it was uh, uh, not passive, but a little bit more passive than the multifamily or single family, and that the scalability was uh, was there. And so started working on that, working with some investors, and you know built a portfolio and was able to retire from my W-2 job in uh, early 2020. That's awesome. So yeah, I mean, it sounds like what you were trying to do is get out of the grind that nine to five type gig, which my understanding of what you were doing is probably more than nine to five. You had pretty serious hours and you were running some pretty good sized projects and everything like that. So yeah. I can understand that. Um, so what has been kind of that one thing that er that you've noticed People who are getting into the business, as much as they research, they just don't expect. And then when they get in, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know about this, or I didn't expect this, or I didn't learn about this in whatever course they took or whatever books they read. What's that one thing where you're like, man, be ready, because this is this is gonna be something you need to know. Yeah, well, um, in my opinion, it seems that when people go and start to learn about the uh, mobile home park investment space when they start to look into the uh, managing, operating, purchasing, finding properties, uh, all the financing. Uh, they, they go to different courses and they might look at, uh, you know, um, different uh, boot camps, things like that. And the limitation in all of this training is that none of it, no matter how good or how expensive or how involved, 
none of it could ever teach you everything you need to know. And so I think a lot of people focus on these things and many of them focus on, for instance, they say, well, you know, how do I go about doing, you know, this thing or that thing? Well, they don't even have a mobile home park yet, but they're yeah. wondering how they go about operating this thing or how they refinance it when they haven't even found one to buy. And so really what I think is that when people look at education, when they start learning about uh, investing in mobile home parks, look at the mindset of it and look at the principles of it and basically take away uh, the ability to think critically and to work through issues because no one can tell you what exact issues you're gonna come across. Yeah. And so really what you need to learn is how do I deal with those issues? How do I look at those issues in order to be able to deal with them properly? And also focus on what's next. Okay, so if you're driving 500 miles, you're not worried about turning left 300 miles from now. You're worrying about turning left three blocks from now. So yeah. worry about turning left three blocks from now. Once you turn, worry about the next turn at that point. So that's kind of what I would say that people can really more focus on when they're looking at education, things like that. But what I would say is the one thing that I would probably tell people that were looking at getting into this business is no matter what you hear, it's not quite as passive as yeah. what most people <laughs> sell it as, is it, Mario? I, no, it's not. <laughs> it's totally not. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, I think I think you're right. You know, when people get started, they get all this information, right? And they're overwhelmed and they're thinking about the financing. They're thinking about, you know, their their sales strategy on the homes and all these different things, but they haven't bought a park yet. Right. And so they spend a lot of time on things so far down the road when really what they need to be thinking about is, okay, how do I get that first deal? How do I finance that first deal? Where's the equity coming from to buy that? Then when you own it, then you can start figuring out the other stuff, but you gotta crawl before you walk. And so focus on what the next steps are, not necessarily a mile down the road, exactly. right? It's kind of what you're saying. No, that's great. And the other thing that is funny is whenever I hear somebody saying, oh yeah, it's, you know, mobile home parks, you just rent out the dirt. It's so easy. There's no management there. You know, it's just, they make it, they under, they underestimate or others downplay the amount of management involved with running these deals. And then people buy them like, oh wow, this is a lot of work. This is this is actually managing a property and I've got to deal with tenant issues and all that. And and so I, I would agree, people underestimate that and they get in and they go, whoa, I'm not buying any more of these, I'll sell this, you know? Yeah. So hopefully they bought it right. Sure. And maybe we can buy it from them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we had, we had some really good conversations today. We were talking I mean, pretty deep. We like to get into kind of different the nuances. None of our businesses are perfect. You know, obviously when you watch social media, everybody makes it seem like their business is perfect and there's just no problems, right? We're just making millions and buying all these properties and it's just easy, it all goes smooth. But in all reality, even like when we were sitting today talking, we're kind of like, yeah, I've had that problem too. Oh yeah, I've got that issue going on right now. Or, you know, this is how I dealt with it. But, you know, there's a lot of, things that happen in business that you just have to have, um, you have to be resourceful. Right. You gotta figure out how to work through those issues. And you'll find as you scale, maybe at one or two parks, I don't feel like there's a whole lot of business need, you know, business aspect to it. It's kind of simple. You're managing sure. maybe one or two properties. But as you scale that, you really have to start creating, you know, a, a business system, staffing, HR, you know, accounting systems, and all this other stuff. We were talking about one of the accounting systems that I've previously implemented and you're implementing right now. You gotta really build a business. And so it just takes resourcefulness, creativity, and knowing where to look and who to ask to do sure. it. Sure, and, and the difference between a business and just operating um, one or two parks, like you said, is do you have systems and processes in place? If you were to decide to go to Europe for two months, would your business run better or fall apart? If it falls apart, you don't have a business. If it runs the same or better without you, that's a business Yeah, because it's based on the systems and the processes. I'd say a year ago, I probably would have said, oh crap, it's gonna fall apart. And thankfully at this point, I think it runs better when I'm not around. <laughs> They're like, get out of the way. You're, you're slowing us down. So that's what you want. That's what you want. But um, I, I totally agree. It's creating a system and a business. So let's talk about management. Okay. And we don't have to get super in detail. You don't have to mention any names, but paraphrase maybe, 
a big lesson that you learned and you've told myself and some other people about um, from a, I don't want to say a mistake, but something that you learned really the hard way with third party management yeah, in third, our industry. Third party management is very difficult in our industry. Reason being is that the economics just aren't there. If you think about a property management company, they typically work on a uh, the basis of uh, uh, they have a percentage of gross income yeah. that they make. So if you're going to manage a 100 unit property and the uh, the rent in a mobile home park is $400 per month per tenant mm -hmm. versus a 100 unit apartment building that's $1,500 a month. The economics are substantial. The differences are very big. So oh, yeah. in reality, if you think about it, if you were going out to start a management company, why would you even manage mobile home parks? Yeah, in the you first wouldn't place? You'd go for something that generates a lot more revenue and then you get exactly. paid paid more money off. Sure. And so where where mobile home parks may be much simpler to manage, where mobile home parks may um, lend themselves well to third party management would probably be lifestyle choice parks where the lot rent is twelve, fifteen hundred dollars a month because they're in Florida or or maybe they're in uh, you know California or Arizona. or Arizona. Some of the parks in, in Colorado have really high lot rents. Yeah. Places like that that would work um, and, I, and I know for a fact that there is you know there are companies out there that work in those markets that do a very good job people are very happy another thing would be if your park is completely stabilized mostly tenant owned homes so it starts to shift back to being worth it because even though you're not making as much money on the management of this four or five hundred dollar per unit as you are with the fifteen hundred dollar unit you also don't have to worry about the toilets, the trash, yeah. the, the, uh, the 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 electricity, the plumbing, all that stuff that's inside of a, a multifamily unit that the property managers have to constantly maintain, deal with calls, call outs, service calls, things like that. If you have 100% stabilized all tenant owned homes, you really don't have to deal with that stuff. Right. So if your property has any aspect of say value add, construction, uh, a lot of tenant owned homes, or excuse me, park owned homes, you may want to really consider not going with third-party property yeah. management. We did go with third-party property yeah, management. Let's talk briefly about that. Tell, yeah, tell yeah, kind of was, what, um, what, what happened because this sounds it, like this was really, a nightmare. Yeah, it, it, like. it didn't it didn't go as, as well as we planned. Um, Understatement of the year. Yeah, and, and initially <laughs> it actually went fairly well. Yeah, uh, it just seemed to start to we seemed we had some issues uh, and they started to you know stack on top of one another and so we you know we had this stacking of issues and finally it got to a point where it was like well we really need to start thinking about taking over management or finding a different third-party property manager and so you know that was what prompted the w-2 the removal of the w-2 position so i can spend more time um and focus Operating on the, the parks right the uh the property management side of the business making sure things were taken care of and it wasn't until really we, we we took the properties back that we found most of the the big issues that were happening. Um, and here we are, uh, we're roughly five months into this process, and it's just it's taking quite a bit to work out of some of the issues that we that we had. And so um, I personally, for the mobile home park space, if you're looking at purchasing a mobile home park, I would highly recommend um, deciding from the very beginning. That you're going to operate this yourself yeah. uh, deciding from the very beginning that you're going to build out systems and processes while you're small because building systems and processes while you've got this big portfolio is pretty tough yeah because yeah, yeah. you're managing the day-to-day -day, plus you're having to put exactly. systems in place and you know every any mistakes cost you yeah yeah so if, if i if i had a time machine and i could go back i would have built from the the very first property build those systems and processes out record everything you do write down what you did to solve the issue, whether or not it worked, so that you can build these systems and processes organically throughout the, the, the growth of the yeah. property. Build uh, it, it as you go. Exactly, yeah. it may not be as fast, but it's much less painful. And so, because I can tell you, the pain is going to come one way or the other. Yes. It's either gonna come in little bits at the front, or it's gonna come in a rush at, a, at some other point. But um, yeah, so third-party property management, haven't had good luck with that. Have spoken to many others, um, they haven't either. Uh, the only people that seem to have luck with that are folks that have 
very large portfolios, let's say 5,000 plus, and they may have many port, uh, many uh, properties that are in the you know thousand dollar, twelve hundred dollar lot rent areas. Uh, lots of you know tenant owned homes, all stabilized properties. Those are really the types of folks that are doing well with third party property management. If you're just starting out, you're giving you know 100 or two units. Maybe there's a lot of park owned homes. There's some value add going on, capex. Uh, then I would highly recommend not going with the third party property management because I think it begins to fall apart at that point. I think I think what happens too, and, and this is the thought process, this is the logic behind it. We go, all right, so I can either spend time running these properties or I can hire someone who's a professional that already knows how to run them really well and they can just implement their systems into my parks right really fast, right away, and then I can go focus on buying more communities, right? Then we, we, we go into it with the mindset of, if we have a third party manager, then we can focus on scaling and buying more communities. Will they run what I have? The problem with that is exactly what we talked about. There's a lot of project management, especially in buying turnaround parks, and that's in a lot of capital improvements and even bringing in homes. There's, it's just a lot of moving parts. You've really got this hybrid business model of a rental and a sales model all in one, and that's hard for a third party company to do, let alone the, the, the income standpoint that we talked about too. So if you've got a large portfolio and you bring it to them, they're gonna put a lot of effort into it. If you've got a smaller portfolio, when I, you know, he said 5,000 and up, that's probably a realistic you know, um, threshold of when it starts to maybe make sense. But at that point, if you've got 5,000 lots, it probably makes financial sense to do it yourself and hire just key people to run it because you've got enough revenue to hire very quality people with a lot of experience and skills to come in and build up your own management company. So I, I think I agree with you 100%. I've, it's crossed everybody's mind. I thought about doing it. Um, I think everybody does. But then you realize that there's horror stories out there and it's just better to build out your own management company and do it right the first time. The other way that I would recommend people solve that problem if you're not a management, property management type person, is to partner with somebody who already has that in place. So um, me personally, I'm not an operations property management guy. So we built out a management company and you know, I'm sure, Paul, I'm sure you would agree that if somebody came to you and said, hey, I've got this, you know, pretty good deal, um, I'd like to buy it, but I need I need a partner that can help me run it, you'd probably consider that. Sure. I know I would, you know. Um, and so team up with people who already have the systems and, and processes in place, have them invest in the deal with you, partner up, whatever, and, and that's another alternative route instead of just hiring a third party company that has no skin in the game. If you want to learn more about mobile home parks, drop in the comments below maybe a few questions that you have. What are those one or two things that you really want to know about getting started in mobile home park investing? All right, so Pablo, let's talk about um, capital, okay? Let's say somebody is looking to get into buying mobile home parks and they're like, I just don't have a lot of money. I've maybe got enough, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars saved up or something. How, how would you recommend they pursue buying parks with maybe $200,000? Might not be enough to, to buy something or buy multiple parks with. Sure. Um, you know, I, I've, I've actually heard people teach that you can get into this with no money, you know, by doing wholesaling, things like that. Um, I, I don't agree with that because, you know, wholesaling is a great way to get in, to make money, uh, to be able to learn to source deals. Um, and you may even not intend to wholesale, but you wholesale deals because you found something that didn't exactly work for you. That's a great way to do it, but it's not free. Right. The marketing, no. uh, skip tracing, you know, um, earnest money deposits, it's, it's all money. Yeah. So you can get into this with a small amount of money, um, but really there are, there are certain things that you need to purchase a multiple park. You, sure. You've got to have credit. You've got to have experience. You've got to have cash. You've got to have a great deal, right? Yeah. So you don't have to have all those things yourself. It'd be great if you had one, probably two. Yeah. But you can more the better. But <laughs> the more the better. <laughs> yeah. But you can leverage everything. Okay. Yeah. So if you're really good at finding deals, when you have the deal, you have the leverage, and you can leverage everything else, just like capital, right? Yeah. You can leverage, uh, you know, intellectual capital, just like you can leverage currency. Sure. And so my recommendation is 
focus on the deal. Because if you have a great deal, you're going to find the capital. And if you don't believe that, and if you feel that you've found a good deal, but you can't find the capital, you probably haven't found as good a deal as you thought. Agreed. <laughs> if it's a good deal, the money's gonna be there. Yes, if you find a 150 space park, completely you know, stabilized, yeah. tenant owned homes in a primary metro for, you know, a 10 cap, trust me, the money the will find there. you. The yeah. money will be there. There's right. no issue with the money. Fighting people off. Yes, so you have to focus on, uh, you know, if you have, you know, six figures in the bank account, the marketing and, and finding properties is, is no issue. You can, you know, you can put in offers, you can pay for skip tracing, you can pay for all of that marketing uh, costs, you can pay for mailers, uh, you can you can pay people to make cold calls for you, uh, you can pay yourself while you're making cold calls, whatever you have to do, and you can put earnest deposits down. So you have to get that deal. Now if you're just going out and you have no experience, that could be a little tricky yeah. because think about if someone came to you and said, you know, Mario, I want you to invest $500,000 with me. And I've never done this before. Yeah. Here. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So if you have yeah. 100 or $200,000, buy a small park. Yeah. Run it yourself for a year or two years until you really feel that you've got that track record. Now you've got that experience. Now you've got that track record. Uh, and you can feel good about going and talking to people yeah. about, hey, I have this deal. I want to purchase it. Uh, I'm going to put some skin in the game. Maybe you put thirty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in. Um, I would, you know, you would like the, some investors to put the rest of the capital in, and then the bank to make the loan on the property, and it all works out because everybody looks at your track record. Yeah. Whereas, if you have no track record, even if you have a good deal, chances are you're going to find the capital for that deal, but you may not be in it. Yeah. How you want to be in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they may buy the contract from you or they may give you a nominal amount of equity just for bringing the deal, but it's not going to be what you think it is. You're sure. not going to get this 50% equity and you're going to be, you know, paying preps to these investors. It's not going to really work out that way in the first one because, you know, if you have family members that have a lot of money and they're willing to risk it on you, great. It could work out that way, but typically you've got to have that track record. Yeah. But you can also partner with someone with the track record. That's a great point. So, Team up you know. with people who already have the yeah. track record. And it also goes for raising capital. Maybe you say, well, I don't even know anybody with enough money sure. to buy this deal. Well, who do you know that owns other parks that can help you raise the money? And obviously you get a securities attorney to put together the, the private placement offering and all that kind of stuff from a legal standpoint. But you can team up with other people to do that. But I, I think you're right. I mean, if you're starting out with a small amount of capital and go buy a smaller park, run it, learn it. That way you can build the track record and show proof of concept. Yeah. Because yeah. people want people to work with people who have already had some success. And so yeah. do it on a small scale on the first one. Um, or if you got something big that's on the table, partner with somebody who's sure. done it before. Yeah, so, if there's something big, don't let it go just because you don't have the money to close on it. You, you, you can get the deal done. Again, be willing to take concessions because of the fact that you don't bring as much to the table as someone who could get a high level of equity just for bringing the deal to the table. But uh, the other thing too is, you know, when you when you find these deals, um, you hear a lot of people kind of downplaying small parks. Yeah. Don't look at small parks, don't buy small parks. I do that sometimes. I found this great deal, but it's yeah. only 30 pads. Sure. Don't be afraid of those. Right. Because, you know, someone starting out with, with a smaller amount of capital, if that's all you can buy, it does a couple of things. A, it gives you the track record. Yeah. Because a lot of times if people say, well, have you ever owned and operated a park before? And you say, yes, I have. They're probably not even gonna ask you the size of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? You've done this before, okay, cool. Yeah, the, the other thing is, is that a lot of people don't realize it. Uh, it's all subliminal, but there are a lot of roadblocks in beginners' minds. And it's not until you actually close on that property, start managing it, where your brain kind of moves that roadblock aside and says, okay, we're, we're good, you can actually do this. Yeah. A lot of people, they tell themselves with these positive affirmations, I can do this, I'm gonna buy this park, I'm gonna run it. 
but your brain is in the background and you don't even notice it being like, no, you can't do it. Yeah, you can't. There's so some you're out there no matter sure. what. So you have yeah. a thousand steps to get there and at step 587, your brain's like, yeah, go left here. And you don't even realize it. Totally. Once you purchase that first property, you go through the closing process, you go through the operations process. It's only then when your mind really gets freed up when you really truly believe that you can do it and you can move on to bigger things. And so you have that confidence and you have that ability and you don't sabotage yourself Yeah, and you're able to go out and do that. It's good stuff. So what's Pablo working on in his business right now? Like what's one thing that you're, that you're working on doing within your company specifically um, that maybe the viewers might be interested in and you know, simply, you can just kind of maybe give high level, explanation of what you're doing to maybe improve your company or grow your company right now? Sure. Right now, um, we're focusing on utilizing technology yep. uh, to automate things. And we talked to, a ton about that today. Yeah. Yep. So yep. utilizing technology, there's so much out there right now. It's unbelievable. And the thing is, is if you're not out there searching for it, you may have never hear of it. Yeah. Uh, there could be technology out there that's a total game changer <laughs> so, that you didn't even know existed. Like so today. You, you've got to be out yeah. there looking for it. So we're talking and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm working on setting up this dog tracking service or animal tracking service. I'm like, what's that? He goes, oh yeah, it does all this stuff and it tracks the, tenant, the residents' animals. And I'm going, why have I never heard of this before? <laughs> like, I need this. Yeah. So yeah, no, great, great point. There's sure. a lot of stuff out there. If you're not looking for yeah. it. You've got to look for it. You've got to talk to other people. Yep. You've got to go to the trade shows. But technology is a big is a is a big thing that is a force multiplier. Okay, it's kind of like you know a sniper on a battlefield. You know, yeah. uh, a sniper can do the job of of you know fifty soldiers if, if he's used effectively. Right. So utilizing technology is something that is very important, and so that's what we're working on right now. We're we're assessing different technologies, and we're starting to implement new technology in order to uh, increase our productivity, increase our efficiency. And then the other thing is starting to make sure that our systems and processes are adequate and that we have systems and processes for everything. Yeah. And I mean everything. Yeah, yeah. So we're making sure that our systems and processes are, are built, that they're in place, that they're vetted, they're tested, and that they're refined so that we can utilize them so that anyone can step into a position because of the fact that at some point, anyone's going to have to step in a position. Yeah. If you run a business, it's going to happen. So if you don't have the systems and processes in place to be able to plug and play, you could be in trouble. Um, and so that's what we're working on. I think we're up to about 86 procedures right now documented. And what's funny is once you get them documented, then you, got, then you have to actually maintain them. And you've got to um, keep updating them and make sure they're relevant and tweak them. Because if you want people to operate on your procedures, you actually have to have them accurate, right? So what, now what we do is every Tuesday morning, our operations coordinator teams up with whoever's involved in that procedure. It might be some managers, might be you know, an accountant, might be whoever, whoever's involved in that procedure, and they pick out one to two procedures for that day, and they actually review it, update it, and at the bottom they put review date and, and revision dates on it. So we can track when they were changed and when they were last updated, and every week, we're going in and updating one to two of those so that over time we're constantly keeping what we have in the books, you know, procedure wise, up to date and functional. So it's kind of amazing though how much will change in even just a year. I mean, you're doing something one way, and if you don't tweak it to what you're, what's working now, you'll start going through these procedures and be like, man, we, we can't even follow this. And so it's just really important to keep those updated. Yeah. First, document them. And let me give a tip too. Anybody who's looking to do this, start out with processes first, okay? Which means high level. First we do this, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. Then what you do is, and, and that's kind of the workflow. And then after that, you do the procedures, which are how do you do each one of these steps, right? In very, very detailed explanation, both either video or um, in Word doc or whatever. But it's process and then procedures and then you do policies. And we haven't really gotten heavily heavy into the policies yet, but policies are kind of the guidelines and rules around the procedures. So um, once you get all that documented, yeah, it's pretty much plug and play. You can take one person out, put a new person in, and it's it really makes your business a true business and a system. Right. 
So, um, Pablo, I appreciate you hanging out with me for a little bit. I'm looking forward to dinner too. Um, Pablo and I and one other partner, Ekaterina, we are partners in the MHP tribe, which is something that I definitely want to plug on this episode. If you haven't checked it out, it's mhptribe.com or you can join our Facebook group. It's totally free. Um, so we're not pitching you anything, we're not selling anything. It's just um, a great group of mobile home park investors, tons of free content. And um, so we, Katarina put it together and Pablo and I came on later and we've just built this awesome ecosystem for investors. So I'd highly recommend that. Also subscribe to this channel, make sure that you're connected because I'm gonna keep putting out content. I'm gonna keep bringing awesome people like Paul on to talk about their business. And um, drop in the comments, like I said, if you've got some questions you'd like to know about how to get started in mobile home park investing. So from there, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Check out the video 